everybody. Welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It's Francis. And uh, today with me, I have Jonathan Katz, uh, who, it, uh, as you were listening to this, the book uh, is out, came out yesterday, uh, called Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines and the Making and Breaking of America's Empire. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank, thanks for having me. I'm a big, big fan of the pod, and it's, uh, it's really great to, to actually be here. It's great. I'm glad that both of us are big fans of each other. This is going to make this a lot easier. <laughs> so, so Jonathan, um, obviously, I I am a, a veteran, and the a lot of the the point of my my show is the you know military industrial complex. That that wonderful phrase that's been getting kicked around for uh, you know God decades at least, um, and, and you know. As as a leftist veteran, you know I have a copy of War is a Racket. I've gone through it, um, and and really that's all that I ever knew about Smedley Butler. Um, you know, you know he 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 was awarded two medals of honor, but like medals of honor before, um, but before World War One, so they're always a little bit sus. Um, but but I'm, I'm I'm curious as to what is it that made you want to go uh and and really get very involved in in writing this book so i've 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 learned uh over the years that i've I've been working on this project to divide the world into two categories people who've heard of smedley butler before i bring him up and and people who haven't and among the the people who have heard of him uh, you know they tend to be marines who you know learn about the Two medals of honor in, in boot camp, and you know other other right. assorted people in the military, um, and then you know leftists who who know about him, and to, to a certain extent libertarians and and other sort sure. of anti war folks um, who learn about him through you know war as a racket, uh, his you know whistleblowing on on the fascist coup of 1934, the business plot stuff like that. I am of a much smaller smaller group, at least among Americans, um, because I learned about Smedley Butler in Haiti. Um, which was where I was based for uh, three and a half years as the correspondent for the Associated Press uh, from 2007 until 2011, which means that I was there for the the earthquake that that uh, struck in in 2010 and knocked down my house and right. killed a bunch of my friends and almost killed me. Um, and it was while I was so I I you know I I'd heard his name before that. Um, Always in relation to Haiti, uh, where he played a, a major role in the U.S. occupation of Haiti. But when I sat down to write my first book, which was about the earthquake and you know the failed response, um, I you know sat down and I was looking at history to sort of figure out how like how did we get here? How did a 7.0 earthquake become the deadliest earthquake ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. And like the death toll was upwards of 100,000. The official death toll the, the government put out was 316,000, um, you know, in, in a metropolitan area of 3 million. It was, it was horrendous. And all roads kept leading sort of back to the occupation. And I needed, or I thought I would need maybe, you know, a character or something to sort of carry that through you know, in the book. And I came upon Smedley Butler, um, who was really important in, in the occupation of Haiti and also just like a fascinating character on his own. Um, as a writer, like the, the first thing that stuck out to me was, uh, you know, he had these letters uh, that were published in, in a compilation called Letters of a Leatherneck. Um, and, you know, since he had grown up as a Quaker on Philadelphia's mainline, uh, he was always ad addressing his parents with, you know, these and thys, you know, thy, thy, my mm -hmm. affectionate son has killed a lot of Asians today yeah. and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, so this guy's interesting. And then I, you know, I, I, I used, you know, the, the, the journalist's uh, go-to tool of uh, google.com and I plugged sure. in Smedley Butler. I work in, I work in IT. I get it. <laughs> and, the things that come up are like war is a racket, and you know I was a, a racketeer for capitalism, and so my first response to that, you know, just initially was like, well, this must be a different guy, or like maybe his son. I was like, how many people could there be named Smedley Butler? Right. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh wait, it's the same guy. And I kind of like I went down that rabbit hole a little bit, but I was I had a bunch of other things to do while I was writing that book. And I didn't end up using any of that in, in, in that first book in the big truck that went by. But in the years after that, I couldn't get this question out of my head. Like Butler in Haiti was known as literally, they called him the devil. 
in in uh, in Crail, they called him. You know, uh, I, I was talking to a, a Haitian friend of mine when I was telling him that I was writing a book about Smedley Butler, and he was like, "Oh, you know, leave way méchant." Like he's like, he's so evil. How yeah. is but, yeah, so Butler, yeah. B- Butler is not like I think the biggest eye opening thing for me during this is that you know you hear war is a racket and then you hear just like oh we've got all these people you know dying for uh, American imperialism and American capitalism and that's wrong and it's like just specifically that is wrong people dying for America is perfectly okay with them. Smedley Butler fucking loved war. It seems he yeah. he was all about it. He loved to do it. He uh, hated being in Haiti after a while because he's just like I'm just a cop to you know black people. Yep. Um, though he he used words that were uh, much more unkind. Mm-hmm. You know, 1914s uh, upper middle class white guy. What do you expect out of him? But you know he. He fucking it, it was never a I don't want to, you know, we shouldn't be doing war. It's, you know, and as you mentioned, the business plot, it was never we shouldn't, you know, fascism is bad. It's just fascism is bad here. Fascism yeah. in Haiti, perfectly fine, because right. I mean, in some ways you could describe him as a full on fascist uh, in in some, you know, the iron fisted kind of thing. And, you know, it's I don't I don't. I don't know it because, you know, he was never technically like a government employee. So I don't really think that, you know, uh, beyond being a Marine, um, I don't really think that you can, uh, you know, put him as a governmental fascist. But Mm -hmm. he certainly felt like these people are beneath me. They are not, you know, with 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 some time and some tutelage, maybe they can be, you know, good, you know, just like your your normal good white Protestant uh, upstanding American man. Um, if we punch them enough in the face yeah. uh, and and that's literally never worked like it never you you just make people more angry at you um and you're the only way that you you know manage to maintain something like that is obviously you maintain strength over them um he had no problem with some of that and and you know i i, I want to get into a lot of it but like the other the other big thing mm-hmm. that was very surprising for me about smedley butler is that he's pretty much directly like responsible maybe the first guy who was just like no cops need like machine guns from the army yes need tanks and like use those it was just like no get me tanks get i and and was and told cops like as a cop he was a cop for a bit in philadelphia and was just like i will give medals to anybody who shoots gangsters down in the street yeah like it is it is incredible to you know have this um I have this idea of a person based only on war as a racket and based only on maybe a quick like Wikipedia search and then to read through the, this book and just be like, man, he was like he had some good ideas about how bad American imperialism is. But definitely there's some conversations that need to be had about the man himself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think this book is really going to do if people uh, pick it up. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, you're really you're really nailing a lot of it here. So. um you know, I think that, you know, it's, it's the question that a lot of people often have, uh, uh, you know, like a, a stock question that I'm, I'm getting a lot is, is sort of, you know, what, what, what made his change of heart, right? Like, so he did all these, you know, it, you know, the thing that people know is they know war is a racket. They know, um, you know, his, his famous confession, which was actually in a, a, another article uh, that came out the same year as war, as war is a racket in a socialist magazine called Common Sense. Um, you know, where he said, you know, I, I helped in the raping of, you know, half a dozen Central American republics. I made, you know, China safe for standard oil and all these things. And so, you know, they know that he, they know that he had done these things. Um, and then the question is sort of, you know, w- w- you know, what, what accounts for his change of heart? And as you note, um, uh, there's a, you know, he, he, he spends, uh, uh, two, three years in charge of the Philadelphia police department. Um, he takes a, a brief leave from, from the Marine Corps in large part because like, there's no action. Um, and, and as you say, like he, he's, you know, directly responsible for, for, you know, militarizing the Philadelphia police and, and, and helping, uh, you know, the, the militarization of, of police all over the United States. And to a certain extent, you know the the, the 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 medium answer is that at less than a change of heart he just sort of he kind of ended up back where he started you know he grows up as a quaker he's you know brought up with sort of these you know pacifist and egalitarian ideals and you know he joins the marines um in 1898 uh to fight against the spanish empire in in uh in cuba 
Um, and you know, he, he's 16 years old. He lies about his age. He actually tries to go to the army first. They're like, get the, get the fuck out of here. Like, right. You're a kid. And the Marines are like, oh no, we definitely need people. <laughs> Wait, okay. Can you, can you pull a trigger? Can you, you know, sit the fuck down and shut the fuck up and yeah. do what you're told? All right. You're a Marine now. Yeah. Could you, could you, could you, could you stand in front of this bullet? Good. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, but so he, you know, he did that, you know, because of ideals. I mean, they were, you know, a 16 year old's version of ideals, but he was like, I'm going to f- fight, you know, the, the Spanish empire. I'm going to, you know, shoulder a rifle and free little Cuba was, was the way he put it later. And, you know, the, 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 the slightly longer answer is, you know, what, you know, it, it, it was what, what made him sort of lose sight of those ideals um, at, at the beginning and, and, and throughout the course of his career um, you know, part of it is just sort of, you know, blindness of, you know, just sort of blindness to race, blindness to class, all, 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 all the kinds of things that, that, although he became much more class conscious as his life went on, but it was really that, that you said it, like he loved war. He loved fighting. He loved action. He, he, he had a chip on his shoulder. He had something to prove. Um, he was the son of a congressman. Uh, Thomas Stalker Butler and the grandson of, of a com, uh, congressman, uh, uh, Smedley Darlington, who was his namesake, his, mo- his mother's father. And, you know, he, you know, he, so he, he's never an enlisted. He, he's, he immediately, because his family is rich and his father's a congressman, he immediately gets made a, a second lieutenant um, and is actually kind of stuck in you know, boot camp essentially at uh, the Marine barracks with these other pretty boys who are also, you know, sons of privilege while the first Marines, you know, go ashore um, and fight the big battle at Guantanamo Bay. And he, he arrives at Guantanamo a couple of weeks later after the fighting's over. And he's kind of got a chip on his shoulder because he knows that all of these, all of the other Marines, you know, who for the most part were, you know, white, lower class, working class guys who had been left, you know, unemployed by the last depression in 1893. Um, and they were, and, you know, they, they were just really just, you know, dragged off, off the street and, and bars in, in the Northeast and, and, and put on a, on a banana boat and, and sent to Cuba. And here he is like, you know, in this, in this fancy uniform with his fancy name, um, you know, Smedley was, the, <laughs> was a posh name even then. And, and he was like, I'm going to prove myself. And, and everywhere he goes after that, you know, he, 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 he just, he runs toward combat. He, he does everything that he can to show that he belongs there and that he is a man and that he's, and that he's, you know, worthy of respect from other Marines. Um, and it's really him sort of chasing that. And to a certain extent, it's chasing glory, but it's really chasing sort of a sense of himself and a sense of himself as a man. Um, that really is what drives him through a lot of his career. And it's only sort of, you know, toward the end uh, when 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 he really starts taking stock of of what he's done and 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 you know he's you know dealing with PTSD and moral injury and all of these other things that he's like you know well maybe you know I love war but maybe maybe less of it and 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 maybe you know to a certain extent like you know the soldiers are are victims here too. Yeah, and and definitely reading <clears throat> while reading through your book, I see my own parallels with with Smedley Butler. Like, obviously, I have not you know put down an uprising in uh, Veracruz myself, but you know you you get you you get lured into this thing because um, and I don't know what like media was back then, but certainly you know media when I was joining in two thousand is you know the army. It's where you can be a man and you can do you can do these tough things, and you know it's. Uh, at the time, it's like, well, I haven't really ever done anything exciting or difficult, so I'll join the army and I'll do that. And then you kind of stick around because it's like, well, it's not that hard. You can uh, you, maybe you don't mind the job, but, you know, and, and as long as you don't think too hard about what you're doing, like, you know, beyond here's my job and here's the people that I work with, as long as you're not like, why exactly are we still in Afghanistan or mm-hmm. why exactly did we go into Iraq? I don't see any weapons of mass destruction. So why are we still here? And, you know, I, I do feel like those, the, the, those are the biggest hurdles for any veteran to, to, to step over. Um, every, every veteran, especially the current ones, uh, you know, the post nine 11 veterans will have to, you know, they have to, they have to come to a reckoning, um, with their time overseas. And that's not, you know, just a post nine 11, that's every veteran, every, everybody who's ever served and gone into another country 
has to, you know, in, in whatever way, justify it to themselves. And um, a lot of people just don't think about it. And they're just like, well, it's the thing that I did because that's what we do. Uh, and it feels like Smedley Butler, at least, you know, kind of saw is just like, you know, I've, I've watched people die. I've watched my, my Marines die. And, and another thing I will note, he loved his Marines. Like Mm -hmm. he was, he sounded like, you know, I mean, he was an insane officer that would lead you into battle, but he would lead you into battle. Like he was the guy out front or at least, you know, running through the, uh, the streets, you know, with you. So, you know, from, from a personal like leadership kind of role and, you know, he did all these, you know, uh, the fireside sing-alongs to, you know, keep, uh, keep morale up uh, during World War One. You know, it when you love your troops and when you don't, you know, f- when, when you're a leader and you're just like, these guys are here to support me and to make me look better. And you want to do that for them, too. And I think that that's also a big p- portion of what why did why did, you know, uh, Private uh, Smuckatelli here get whacked, but, you know, in friggin' on an island in the middle of nowhere. Like, why yeah. Why are these people dying over here? Other than, you know, uh, I think um, the first time I noticed, I noted him uh, saying something like, hang on a minute, maybe this isn't great, Is was in Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the... Uh, if, if, you're, if you're a leftist who, who does have some kind of uh, 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 historical knowledge of America, and, and I, I know I'm all over the place, but I highly recommend this book, not just because of the, the content that we've been talking about, but also if you don't know anything about like our Central American wars that we did pre-World War I, this is a good like kind of introduction to some of those, um, you know, from the, from the view of, uh, of Smedley Butler. Um, who was, as I said, you know, still perfectly fine with uh, with going to war and everything. So he he does have that like real love for his troop. And in Nicaragua, it feels it, that's the first time that he's just like, man, this is this doesn't seem right. And I believe it was Nicaragua, the United Fruit Company or which which, which company wa- was he killing people for at that point? Uh, Nicaragua. So he, he's he's blaming Brown Brothers Bank, um, okay. which is now Brown Brothers Harriman. Uh, which uh, happens to be, by the way, the bank that is across the street from Zuccotti Park. Um, that's th- their headquarters is, is right across the, the, the street from uh, from where the Occupy Wall Street uh, uh, encampment was back in, in 2011. Um, yeah, no, it's it's uh, you know that that's exactly right. And and um, uh, the uh, what's happening in Nicaragua is essentially um, it's it's you know an, an, a uh, an episode of, of what's known as dollar diplomacy, um, where basically under William Howard Taft, the president, um, we decide, okay, uh, the, the occupation of the Philippines, in which Smelly Butler played an important role, um, was too costly. Uh, you know, we, we lost uh, 6,000 U.S. troops. Um, the, the estimates are as high as three quarters of a million uh, Filipino civilians died, not that the U.S. government particularly cared about that, right? Or um, considers them people, you know. right? Exactly. Um, even though they were Americans uh, at the time, um, and they weren't uh, a voting bloc, so it doesn't count. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, Puerto Ricans are Americans too, but America does not care about Puerto Ricans. Exactly, and I, yeah, I talk about in the book like that was that was intentional. They that that, that was the compromise that that uh, basically like you know the racist isolationists and the racist right. expansionists came to. You, you count you count for our numbers, but uh, your numbers don't count when. Uh, uh, when voting, we don't want that nonsense. Exactly, but basically, um, uh, the Taft administration decided, well, you know, let's let's control Nicaragua um, through banks and through a controlling loan. So basically, uh, two two banks, uh, Brown Brothers and and J W Seligman and Company, um, set up a national bank of Nicaragua headquartered in Connecticut. Um, and, and they create a new, uh, currency, the, uh, the Cordoba, um, which is, you know, backed by gold, which at that time was the basis of, of the U S dollar. And, uh, they basically create a debt that Nicaragua has to pay back. And in so doing that then becomes the pretext to take control of Nicaragua's, you know, customs houses. Um, and then when, when Nicaraguans, when Nicaraguan rebels um, rise up and are like, you know, screw you, gringo, like we're like we're, we're, we're decided taking- no, <laughs> exactly. Um, then, then on three different occasions, uh, they sent the Marines um, uh, with led by Smedley Butler, um, and he, you know, uh, kills a lot of people and does a lot of things. But, but as you note, like you know, he's writing in his letters. 
Um, and, and, you know, thank God he was such a, a prolific letter writer. Like that's, that is, that was how I got, you know, uh, the insights and so many, so many of the insights that I had into like what he was thinking at any particular time, but he writes to, um, his parents. He was like, you know, I don't like this, you know, supposedly we're like, we're here defending like, you know, some kind of revolution, but like, there's no revolution. Like it's just these American wildcat, you know, uh, capitalists, um, and the banks that, that are, that are, uh, uh, driving, what we're doing here. And like, literally when, when he, you know, he, he leads this, uh, this, this raid down the the coast from Corinto to Managua. Um, he like, you know, he, he commandeers a train and he's like driving the train full speed and they're busting through like roadblocks, and just like shooting people along the way. And then when he gets to Managua, the capital of Nicaragua, um, he then like, uh, bivouacs half of his Marines in the set in the bank, <laughs> like in, 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 like in the bank building, um, that is, you know, overseen by, by, uh, an American guy named, uh, 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 W. Bundy Cole. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's all obvious what's happening. It's not, you know, and this is, uh, uh, 1912. Um, so he's starting to have these, you know, awakenings, uh, but he continues like he, he's, he, you know, he remains a Marine until, uh, basically until 1931. And, and the only reason he retires, um, is because, uh, first of all, he, he misses out on commandant, um, you know, Marine Corps politics, uh, are complicated. His father has died and, and he gets passed over for that. Um, and then he also gets uh, court-martialed for insulting Benito Mussolini, <laughs> which is an- another interesting thing that happens that I talk about in the book. And then he's like, all right, there, screw this. I'm, I'm, I'm going home. There, there's so many times reading this book where you're just like, ah, Smedley. And then you're like, ah, hell yeah, Smedley. <laughs> like, <laughs> Because because yeah. the the other thing I was talking to a couple people about uh, an- another historian about um, business plot and mm-hmm. um, you know the, the it's hard to it's hard to you know dis- uh, really prove that the business plot happened but basically uh, Smedley Butler went to Congress is just like these guys are planning a coup um, right. they're planning a fascist coup and everybody's like Smedley I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know from from a certain point of view you could be like oh Smedley he's kind of old he's kinda, he's been shot and blown up multiple times maybe he's kind of going senile but then it's just like no but all these people were super fascist and hated the government so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that Smedley Butler was like these guys are going to try to do a coup and one way or another like uh, whether they were like talking about it with him or not and trying to put him as the guy. Like, I think, I think he kind of screwed up with the, I, I don't know if he screwed up. I don't know if this, you know, like I said, if it actually happened or not, but the, uh, yeah, they're, they're going to do a fascist coup and they're going to put me in charge. It's like, ah, uh, is that like, would you be their first choice though? Because they're all fascists and people don't like you uh, <laughs> because you're not fascist. Like again, he, he Smedley Butler was very anti-fascism in America, which is, which I feel like um, was the, the driving point for his post uh, his post-military career. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, yeah, all, you know, all of those are all of those are big questions, and 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 they're ones that you know I I spent a fair amount of time thinking about with the book. First of all, by the way, you know, I knew so I knew that I I was going to have to deal with the business plot somehow because like how do you write a mm-hmm. book about Smedley Butler without dealing with it? Um, but I wasn't sure, you know, how much to make of it. You know, I did like I was like I'm not writing a book about the business plot. Um, and then as I was, I had already sort of made the decision, okay, I need to sort of go, go in on this. I need to, you know, do a bunch of research and, and, and at least answer to my own satisfaction, the question of, was there a business plot? Um, and then in the middle of doing that, January 6th happens (laughs) and I'm like, okay, so this is now the prologue of the book. Um, and, and you know, perfect book ending. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Trumpers. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, so this is a big question is like, you know, why, you know, if there was a business plot, why would they pick Smedley Butler? And and so there there's some things that we can say with with, you know, a fair amount of certainty. Like Smedley Butler believed everything that he was saying. Like he was not he was not making it up. Um and and also like, you know, it it was all extremely plausible. Um his testimony. Uh, so he 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 goes in November 1934 
um, before the the uh, House. It's called the Select Committee on Un-American Activities. This actually ends up becoming ultimately the the the, the House uh, Un-American Activities Committee HUAC, which becomes notorious, you know, during the McCarthy era and just before, you know, as as sort of the the most notorious red baiters in America. Uh, but at that time, HUAC, uh, the, this sort of proto HUAC, is is mostly interested in uh, Nazi plots, you know, not it, it attempts by you know. The German Nazi Party to to infiltrate the United States, which which were happening, and he's like, okay, this has nothing to do with with Nazis. Um, these are just American fascists, people who like maybe like are into Nazis. They're into Mussolini. Um, they're, they're they're taking inspiration from fascist movements in Europe, but it's entirely homegrown. And th- and what he describes to the the committee is the series of meetings with this. Dude, um, Jerry Maguire, Gerald C. Maguire, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he he's he's a he's a, he's like a bond salesman. Uh, he's a veteran. Uh, he has a steel plate in his head because he 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 uh, 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 got injured at sea on a boat off off the coast of France during during the First World War, and uh, he's he's a member of the American Legion, and he's been courting Butler for about two years. Um, first, it was like this, like weird inside thing to like get Butler to address like a convention of the American Legion, and they were going to like demand that he be given the floor, and then he was supposed to like make a speech on behalf of the gold standard, like denouncing Franklin Roosevelt for having taken the dollar off the gold standard. And Butler's like, why would I do that? <laughs> like, but, but, and, like, there's so many, there's so many questions I have for like. Why did they tap Butler? <laughs> like it just doesn't. I'm sure. Like today, just go find Michael Flynn if you really need like a, a messed up fashy general. Like I'm sure they existed. Well, so th- so this is my answer. My answer is that like you know you, you know the line from from um uh, uh all the president's men. You know that the, these weren't very bright, bright guys and things got out mm-hmm. of hand. I think that that seems to describe uh, Jerry Maguire. Um, oh, so fa- so so the fascists weren't very smart. Strange. <laughs> Uh, un- Weird how that keeps happening. Un- unprecedented and un- un- <laughs> un- unknown historically. Um, yes. Yeah, so what they here's what they like here's what they knew about Smelly Butler. And by the way, one of one of the points in the the business plot was at least planned. Um, uh, uh, cat, you know, column is that Jerry Maguire's boss was this guy named Grayson M. P. Murphy. Grayson Mallet Provost Murphy. Like, talk about like all the all the names of this book are amazing, but like even the villains, right? And um, and Murphy was a longtime military intelligence officer. He was, I, you know, in the book I described that he was kind of a like a, a shadow version of Butler. He he was also from uh, Philly. Uh, he he goes to West Point. He he joins the the army and immediately goes into military intelligence. And he's running intelligence ops. All in the Philippines, he's 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 part of you know the the secession plot uh, that 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 ends up breaking off Panama from Colombia uh, for the purposes of building the Panama Canal. Butler's you know on 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 the ground there along with you know John Lejeune and all these others, and um uh and you know he then like he continues even you know after he goes into finance just like doing this shit and he like he, like murphy like goes on a tour in the 1920s of europe um with wild bill donovan who ends up leading the oss you know the forerunner to the cia so like he's somebody who like knows his way around coups and and he's somebody who would have been very familiar with smedley butler and the things he would have known about smedley butler were Butler, you know, overthrowing the government in Nicaragua. Butler, you know, participating in overthrowing the government in Honduras. Butler leading uh, Marines and uh, Jean da- uh, members of the Gendarmerie d'IT. So Butler created essentially the first um, uh, client constabulary force uh, of of you know native troops, um, which is which you know anybody who anybody who's who's uh, spent time hanging out with uh, you know the ANA in Afghanistan uh, mm. or you know it, it works great. We're very good at it. Yeah, as it turns out you have Smedley Butler to thank for that. Like he like <laughs> he he came up he came up with that idea. Yeah, and, there's a lot for for an anti war <laughs> anti capitalist guy. Uh, the fact that uh, that cops have tanks and um, that you have bananas is uh thanks to smedley butler and well, violence well this a lot is of violence i mean that's and i like i don't want to like you know 
get to the end here, but like, you know, that's, you know, to a, to a certain extent, the reason why his, his activism in the 1930s is not more successful is because he has done so much as an individual to create these structures that, that, that are then so durable that he can't fight right. against them. But, but Smedley, you killing like 50 million people meant that it's very cheap to get bananas now. So exactly. exactly. Yeah. Is it why? Well, yeah, one way or the other. I really like bananas on my Cheerios. So the, uh, um, the, you know. uh, the other thing that Murphy and McGuire uh, and all the fascists know about Butler is that in 1932, so you know, two years before he, he reveals the business plot, um, is the bonus march, right? And I'm just like, I don't know. Do I need to explain what the bonus march is or do you uh, people- d- Just very quickly for people who might not know exactly what the bonus army is, yes. So basically, uh, World War I, in order to uh, uh, make the draft more palatable, uh, the Wilson administration says, we'll give you back pay uh, for the time that you were away from your farm or the factory in in Europe, um, but that is not going to be payable until 1945 or you die, um, whichever comes first. And then the Great Depression happens and all these veterans are like, you know, actually, I could use that money right fucking now. And uh, tens of thousands of them converge on Washington, D.C. Uh, to basically, you know, stage, you know, occupy the mall, occupy Anacostia Flats. Um, and uh, most of the establishment, you know, Herbert Hoover's president at the time, you know, they they hate these guys because, you know, they're they're walking around, uh, you know, without shoes. Um, there are black people and white people living together in the sea encampment at a time when when Washington DC is officially segregated uh Douglas MacArthur who's the chief of staff of the army is basically like these are just a bunch of fucking communists and and Butler is like no these are Americans these are these are these are veterans and and they deserve you know uh what has been promised to them and they and they need their government's help right now and he goes to uh, the bonus marchers encampment um, and and gives you know uh, a, a rousing speech you know encouraging them to to keep going, um, and then you know about nine days after he's there, uh, MacArthur uh, and and the army storm the bonus marchers encampment. Um, MacArthur is is aided by his adjutant Major uh, Dwight D Eisenhower. Um, there's a cavalry charge led in the saddle by uh, uh, Major George S Patton, um, and the the army you know these active soldiers fire uh, basically chemical weapons and and uh, charge with bayonets and burn the bonus marchers camp to the ground, and uh, you know, it's like a baby dies. It's 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 awful, and and Butler. So what they knew about Butler was like soldiers love him and they've seen these uh they've you know they've seen these newsreels of him you know addressing 16,000 World War 1 veterans in you know basically right in front of the capitol and they're like that's what we want that's our like <laughs> That's what that's, we. That, I mean, fair that's enough. exactly it. Yeah, yeah. He's got the love of the troops. Also, he's got a great resume of successful coups. Um, so I, yeah, I guess you just kind of kind of feel the guy out and see. Uh, may, maybe if they sold it a little bit different, maybe it's just you know what we we want to do a coup and not do more imperialism. But of course, that's not how capitalism works at all. So. Well, and and the problem is that like they don't they don't understand they don't understand Butler's politics. And like in fairness, like how could they? Like they haven't been reading his letters to his wife and his parents. They but haven't like, read this book called Gangsters of Capitalism yet. So <laughs> exactly, just go back in time about uh, eighty years and hand him this book and just be like, look, guys, find somebody else and maybe at, it'll work out for you. Look at the script. Actually, don't find somebody else because I'm glad that if you were trying to do this, I'm glad it failed. Yeah, because what what they don't realize is that Butler has at this point essentially. I mean, I don't know if I would go as far as to call him a socialist, but he's definitely at, at, at the very least a social democrat. I mean, he's he's out there, you know, like he's 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 tr- he he has this failed Senate run in 1932. His demands everywhere, but he he uh, in 1932 when he's running for Senate, like he's kind of. Um, he's, he's anticipating the new deal. He's, he's, he's coming up with things before FDR who's, who runs for the president that same year before he comes up with them. So he's like, we need social insurance. Like we need, we need, we need unemployment insurance. We need full employment. We need like, we need a jobs guarantee. Um, we need support for organized labor. 
Um, and you know, he's also like, we need prohibition to to stay. So he wasn't right, cool on a- everything. <laughs> Like, well, and that's, you know, that's what happens when you put a Quaker in charge of things. <laughs> like I was at first I was, you know, when I was reading his, about him in Philadelphia, it's like he is just incredibly brutal. But I mean, that's one. That's that's how, who he is. That's how he deals with things. Even even, you know, what like I have to train people. That means I have to put them in the worst hellish conditions and beat the shit out of them on a regular basis. Um, but also I'm a Quaker and I hate booze, um, which for a guy who's who's like murdered thousands of people um whether directly or indirectly that is a that is a huge claim but you know um i've never look not everybody who you know claims religion is exactly um 100 percent with uh you know with with following up on it so he also he also gets he also loves alcohol for part of his life he gets raging drunk especially in in china there's like this there's this story that i found um in the archives of quantico where i spent a lot of time while i was researching this book um and uh it's um it's a short story. Oh my God. I'm just totally blank. It's a commandant who writes the story and now I'm totally blanking on who it was. I'll remember in a minute, but, um, he, uh, uh, he, he, it's like Butler. It's like this long story about Butler, like sitting at a table and he's, and he, and he's just getting thudding drunk and he ends up, um, just singing to himself, uh, sailing down the coast of the high Barbary. And he just like starts screaming louder and louder until everybody's like, shut up. And then he just passes out. <laughs> and, and, and the, 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 the future commandant who, who writes this story, um, uh, makes a big deal about, um, how his, you know, cause Butler had a big nose and he makes a big deal about like how his nose hits the table before the rest of him. But, um, so he, and, but you know, but like he was a man of extremes. Like, you know, he, when he drinks, he goes hard. And when he decides, I'm going to be a dry, like he goes hard. Um, but anyway, so like, you know, Butler was, so, so, so first of all, Butler had, had, you know, at this point very much decided, um, that, you know, if, 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 if the question is left or right, I'm, I'm going left. The other thing that they didn't realize because, you know, how, how could they have known is that he's good personal friends with, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Like they, they hung out in Haiti during the occupation when, when, uh, FDR came, uh, you know, on a trip to oversee things as uh, uh, assistant secretary of the Navy. Um, and I, and as I write in the book, like FDR tries to like get Butler, Butler tries to get involved in like some like personal like benefit scheme that, that FDR like is like trying to get into like the Haitian export game. Um, and, but anyway, so like those, those were two big, big miscalculations that, that, that the business plotters made, but you know, they are, somewhat understandable larger question than that like you know how far had the planning of the business plot gone had everybody who jerry Maguire said was behind it you know had 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 the duponts had general motors had you know mccann erickson ad agency had all these guys like actually said you know pull the trigger we're, we're, we're with you we can't know and part of the reason we don't know is because uh you know the the congressional investigation into this was like extremely cursory and extremely short. They had Jerry Maguire testify. They had like the lawyer for one of sort of the, the the lesser, you know, backers, the, the, the heir to the singer sewing machine factory. He, he testified. Um, But, but, you know, because they didn't really, you know, they didn't drag in, you know, uh, uh, the DuPont brothers um, or Alfred P Sloan or, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, JP Morgan executives, because they didn't bring them in and say under oath, like how serious were you about overthrowing Franklin Roosevelt? (laughs) We just don't know. They probably would have been happy to have it happen because they were, they were very into overthrowing the new deal. And they were very afraid that, that the new deal was, was, you know, going to be the, the rise of Bolshevism in America. But, um, but we just don't know exactly how far how far along the planning had gotten. So um, for this book, you did a lot. You basically um, followed uh, Smedley Butler's career physically. Like you went to all of these countries and you saw the, um, uh, you know, I, I basically you saw the, um, the, the mark that he put on all of these, these places. Um, one of them being the literal, like, you know, Panama Canal, uh, you know, being a major player in that. Uh, and you mentioned that some that uh, Nicaraguan, you know, referred to him as the devil. Do these Central American countries like do they have a uh, you know, ask somebody, you know, anybody like, oh, Smedley Butler and they'll just spit on the ground or has his legacy kind of faded in those areas? And, you know, like the, the name, but not necessarily the actions. 
Yeah, it's it's sort of a mix. So so as you say, so so you know the way that I wanted to do this book, I, I'm I'm a foreign correspondent by training. It's 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 how I've spent. Right. So you got you got to get on a plane and go there to really exactly. to get the feel for. It. And that's I, I want to say it's one thing that I really like about the book is that you parallel like current events, your travels, and Smedley Butler all in those like same areas. Like I got I learned a lot about Cuba just in general because I had no idea like why is Cuba one of our biggest you know quote enemies, but also we own part of Cuba. For for right. some reason, right. you know, like, and it's like, it's because of some dumb thing, like a, a treaty from a hundred years ago. Right. And they're just like, no, we're just never going to give it up. And because <laughs> of this treaty and like Cuba can't do anything about it, because if they did, obviously the full might of America would come down on them, exactly. which I'm sure, I'm sure that America would love an excuse to do that. But um, thankfully they have not, they have not done that. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, as a foreign, uh, foreign correspondent, um, can it kind of give me that feel for it. Yeah, yeah, and and as you know, so uh, yeah, as you know, like the the first place that I go in the book, uh, and 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 one of the first places I, I went to report the book was Guantanamo, um, for for precisely that reason. I also I also went uh, in in mainland Cuba, um, although that that uh, doesn't I, I, that didn't get much page time in the book, but but I, I got a lot of experience out there too. Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, you know, I really wanted I really wanted to explore. You know, to a certain extent, this is a book a lot of, about a lot of things. But to a certain extent, it is a book about historical memory. Um, it's about why Americans don't remember these things, and then why people in the places that we invaded and occupied very much do. Um, so, you know, I ended up in a lot of different situations. I end up um, getting cast as an extra in a Philippine <laughs> Filipino war movie about the Philippine American War. Um, I end up, uh, you know, in a safe house with uh, a, a Sandinista commander, a former Sandinista commander. Um, yeah, that was wild. To, <laughs> to, to, yeah, to read because, like you mentioned, and then I looked her up. Like Jesus Christ, this woman is like killed some people. Yes, she's incredible. Yeah, uh, Monica Baltanado. She, she's yeah. she's and she's become sort of a, she's become a dissident against the Ortega regime, which is why she was on the run. Um, and you know, th th the answer is like you know, it, in terms of so there's you know there's memory of 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 American imperialism. There's there's memory of the specific Marines, and and then there's there's memory of Butler. And it's sort of it, you know it depended where I was in Haiti. A lot of memory of Butler um, because. You know, uh, books like, you know, uh, uh, one of the great Haitian novels about the U.S. occupation, it came out toward the end of the occupation, um, is called The Masked Negro uh, by, by a writer named Stefan Alexi. And uh, the, the villain in that book is a Marine named Smedley Seton, um, who ends up dying. Um, in, he ends up dying in a plane crash, um, but, he but the plane crash doesn't kill him. The Haitian hero of the book, um, there's like this love triangle where like... Fake Smedley is trying to steal the guy's girlfriend, <laughs> and and the Haitian hero ends up like plunging a dagger through Fake Smedley's throat. Um, in case you're wondering what what uh, what Haitians think of Smedley Butler, um, in other places, you know, especially places where he, uh, you know, went when he was younger, um, there's you know there's there's less of a memory of him, um, but but there's you know plenty of memory of. The people that he served with. So in the Philippines, for instance, um, I go to uh, the island of Samar um, and specifically a town called Balangiga, um, which some some of the people listening, will, will their ears will probably perk up. Um, so, so Balangiga is the place where in 1901, um, uh, the army is, is occupying you know, the whole island. I mean, we're, we're, we're colonizing, we have colonized the Philippines at that point. Um, and, uh, 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 company C of, uh, the ninth infantry, um, is, uh, is based in this fishing village and essentially, uh, you know, some of the villagers and some other insurgents, um, stage an ambush on these soldiers in their mess tent, uh, during breakfast. Um, and they kill, I think it was about 48 of them. And in revenge for that, um, they send the Marines. And uh, Smedley Butler would have been with them, um, his, uh, but he had just gotten typhoid in China 
in, in the chapter before that in uh, when, when he was, you know, uh, a part of the invasion force that was responding he, to the Boxer Rebellion. He spends, he spends a lot of time. Get, I mean, I guess all mil, all soldiers at the time spent a lot of time being sick. Spent a lot um, of time being sick. Yeah. Typhoid, uh, Spanish flu at one point, yep. probably. I'm sure that he got cholera just, you know, just because of the way things were. Yep. Like, yep. As you do. And uh, yeah, he was like, they told us not to drink the water, but we were really thirsty. That's, a, that's actually that's actually a part of the book in China. But um, uh, uh, so his his mentor, really, um, uh, Littleton Waller, who ends up becoming a general, but uh, is, is at that point a major, um, ends up uh, overseeing this response to this massacre in Balangiga. And uh, it's it's known. So it depends on, on on what perspective. It's it's known as the Howling Wilderness Campaign because his orders are to turn the interior of the island of Samar into a howling wilderness. Um, Marines probably know it as the March uh, across Samar. Um, you know, for 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 generations, uh, as, as basically as long as any of the veterans were alive, uh, the Marine Corps tradition was that any time a, a veteran of the march, um, you know, came into the Chow Hall, everybody was supposed to stand and say, you know, rise, gentlemen, he served on Samar, um, and uh, it's 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 sort of made its way back into the news recently because uh part of the war booty that happened it was actually the, not the marines who took them but it was it was um uh another army unit um just to be clear <laughs> but they they uh they they grab um these bells from the church in Balangiga and they take them to the United States and they had been um at uh, uh, what becomes an Air Force base in Wyoming um, for decades. One of them ended up uh, in, uh, I think it's the, it was the second ID uh, museum in Korea. But under Trump, uh, it's James Mattis who actually makes sure this happens. They actually ended up getting returned. That happened in, in 2018. But anyway, so in, I go to Balangiga and um you know th- they they have this very strong memory first of all they had the craziest monument i've ever seen in my life it was it, it is basically a life size diorama of the people of this town <laughs> killing american soldiers um i mean i get it <laughs> at, at their breakfast table so they're, sh- they're like the the, the 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 american soldiers are <laughs> like they're holding their 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 spoons from their breakfast and then the and then the the samarenos like are coming in with their their bolos their their machetes like you know over their head screaming um and then i learned while i was there that um uh that the people of this town hold a pageant i believe every year um and 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 i saw the video of of the most recent one where they they recreate both the massacre of the american soldiers and then the revenge massacre uh, of of the marines um in which you know they uh you know in in which littleton waller you know was was ordered uh by by uh, general jake smith uh to um uh to kill or kill and burn um and to, and and to kill anyone you know capable of of uh, bearing arms against the united states and when waller asks him what he means by that, he says, uh, any any male over the age of ten. Um, well, th- th- there's a court martial. Waller's acquitted. Smith is is convicted, but doesn't actually have to end up paying any penalty except taking his very long overdue retirement. Um, but anyway, so to say, like in that pageant, um, you know, they say the name like Littleton Waller, and there's like there's like a, a like a guy from Balangiga um, who you know. The 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 the, the, the Balangiganons, like the people of this town, uh, they play all the roles in the pageant. They dress as the Americans. Um, they 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 all have to uh, dye their hair blonde <laughs> to play the Americans, and uh, and one of them, you know, uh, wears a hat and and carries a silver revolver, and that's Littleton Waller. Um, so you know. They remember, <laughs> they remember, and 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 uh, Rodrigo Duterte, the president of the Philippines, like he talks about Balangiga, um, and and you know the American uh, colonization all the time. They remember all the people in these countries remember, and it influences the way when they when they look at the American flag, when they look at us, um, you know, they remember other things as well, and you know they're they're, they're also like thinking about the NBA, but they are. You know, somewhere in their minds, they're like, "You killed my grandfather! <laughs> like you, 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 you destroyed our country, and you, you took our freedom." 
It's not something that gets fixed overnight. No. Um, as we said, the book is Gangsters of Capitalism. Highly recommend it. Uh, just, you know, if if not to, to gain more information about Smedley Butler, to gain more information of just how big of assholes America was back in the early 1900s. Uh, because it is. I mean, we're involved in the Boxer Rebellion. We're involved in, uh, you know, my, my, you know, if. Nobody knows anything about the Boxer Rebellion unless you dig into it. Like none of these are wars you learn in school. So mm -hmm. if you really want to get a, an idea of of just how how far back kind of the capitalist rot goes, um, this is a great book to to get a starting point in that. And uh, Jonathan, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, Jonathan Katz, uh, you should be following him on Twitter at uh, cats on earth k a t z on earth uh we'll have his uh stuff and we'll have we'll have his uh twitter account linked uh and we'll have a place where you can buy the book uh again gangsters of capitalism jonathan thank you for coming on uh thank you for talking to me about this thank you for sending me a free copy too um <laughs> you're big, welcome big fan big fan of arcs um uh, especially when they're this good so i appreciate it and uh i'm looking forward to you know more books and more writing from you in the future thanks and i just wanted to say that if uh, if anyone wants to see wh where i do most of my writing except for the book at the moment um it's uh, i've got a sub stack um and it's uh it's got a, a vanity url it's it's called the racket for reasons that should be obvious to anybody who's been paying attention to this conversation uh and you can find it at the racket.news all right thank you everybody uh thank you for listening and we'll talk to you next week mm -hmm.